Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Well, you've seen something of the Congo. And I hope that it has um, enabled you to see more clearly as an addition to what is so, was so beautifully done yesterday on the land of Ghana, what it means to work in Africa. Do you have any questions? We have other things we can do. I'm going to ask Louise, my wife, to come up. And uh, you'll find when we sing that we don't sing for the beauty of it. We sing for the novelty of it. But we'll let you know what it sounds like a little bit in Africa, a couple of the languages, and those of Suriname, South America. But before that, do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Any hippos? Crippled people, oh yes. Oh yes. And the sad thing is the crippled people in Africa and many of these third world countries are not cared for. What we would consider normal care, what we would consider helps such as crutches and walkers and wheelchairs, forget it. Where you find the crippled people in Suriname, South America is on the street corners begging. There's a Hindu boy there who has no legs and his hands are like this. He sits at a particular street corner on his backside by a, a traffic light in the capital city and people who have mercy on him hand him something. He knows when I come by and he picks himself up on his arms and he swings his body and takes a couple of big body steps out to the edge of the street and I reach out and give him not only some money, far more than most Surinamers would give him, but also a gospel tract. The deaf get no care. They learn nothing. They do not learn to speak deaf language. No one's there to teach them. They just make guttural sounds. In fact, someone who is crippled like that is ignored and in many ways, in many cases, they're ignored because the people who have them hope they'll die. Someone gets old. In some of the tribes in, the, in uh, South America, such as the um, Acurio, they will take their old people and leave them under a tree. When they cannot any longer keep up. You see, these people never built houses. They never planted gardens. They're just, they just look for food. Hunters and, and, and picking whatever they can find. And so when a person gets too old to keep up with the jungle marches, they'll take that person, sit that, seat that person under a tree with a little food and, and a gourd of water and leave them there to die. And when they're dead, or before they're dead, the jaguars will get them. Or a 20-foot long python. Or a poisonous snake. And that's considered normal. Tremendous ministry. And missionaries do it. Some have orphanages. In some of the tribes of, of the Congo, if a mother dies... They kill the child. 
If a mother has twins, they kill both of them. Missionaries recognizing that have rescued those children and raised them. Raised them from infancy, from a bottle up. Never nursed, never cared for, left to die. Very good question. When you go into these countries, beloved, you're no longer in the USA. No longer in the USA. Now, there are some are better cared for than that. But what we, what we take for granted here in the United States, in so many ways, simply does not exist anywhere else in the world. I say to folks that travel with us, when you go to Europe, you take a step down. Now, you don't think so for the first couple of days, but you find out Europe's not America. When you leave Europe and head to Africa, you fall off a cliff. It's a whole new world. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, could you share maybe a little bit more about your preparation for to be a missionary, how long it would take, and what you actually do? Uh, yes. I'm, let me hold that question because I have a couple of subjects I'd like to deal with. We have a, a ten, 10 to 4. We have time to, to at least sketch some of these things so everyone who is either thinking about going to the mission field or whose son or daughter is thinking about going, will get a better understanding of, of what it means. So I have that on my list, and we'll get to that as soon as we take some of these other quicker questions. Anyone else? Anyone else? If you don't have questions, maybe the slides were good enough to answer most of your questions. Oh, that's true. And we'll answer some of the other questions, of course, in the, in the uh, discussions we have. Louise, would you like to come up? I wanted to give Louise a couple of minutes to just say something to the ladies. And uh, I asked folks, that was okay? They said, sure, come on. And uh, let's sing for them first. That's our novelty. If you were to take a ship a freighter, and set sail from New York City, it would take you approximately 16 days to cross the Atlantic Ocean. You'd probably go to a harbor in Tenerife or somewhere like that, and then go on, and after 16 days you would see clouds on the horizon. As you got closer, you see dark shape. You're seeing land again for the first time. And then if you're going to the Congo, you would enter the mouth of the Congo River. You have to have a ship that can make at least 13 knots to get up that river because when you come to a big bend just below Matadi, the seaport, you have a, a bend there that has a current of close to 13 knots. And so the ship struggles there. At last it docks and you're in Matadi. Matadi is really called, it's really the name for rock in that particular dialect. And they, because of the way they watch the white men cut that rock, cut out roads and streets and areas to build out of that rock, something beyond, totally beyond their capability, they, one of the very common names for the white men in the Congo was birth. They called the white men Mbulamatadi, the breaker of rock. And it's from Matadi. You cannot go further by boat because there's fierce rapids for the next 400 miles up to Kinshasa. So you go around by, river, by road and from there by river or by plain or by road like our, our, where you just saw our outpost. Probably a thousand miles by road, five and a half hours by plane and uh, four days with our diesel powered uh, 180 horsepower, turbocharged, stern drive boat. So you're talking about wilderness. But it starts on your arrival in Matadi. Or landing by air in Kinshasa, the capital. Uh, give you an idea of the languages. You might hear the folks singing, The Great Physician Now Has Come, The Sympathizing Jesus. Old-fashioned missionaries have old-fashioned songs. 
why we enjoy being with you. And it would sound something like this. Mobi kisi masi aye yena bolengo mingi alengi ako kembisa mite mana balendi kembo malamu hawanse kembo ile kiyon sobe. Now that's Lingala, one of the major languages. We always smile when folks say, well, you, you work in Africa, do you speak African? <laughs> well, not quite. In fact, Africa speaks 3,000 languages. And it might interest to you, be of interest to you to know that that until missionaries went to Africa, no language in Africa, none of the three thousands, not one of them, had a word for everlasting or eternal. Now there's a reason for that. The reason is that they have a different concept of time than we have. I should write that down. I'll give them an idea of, before I go any further. African concept of time. Okay, I'll give, tell you that before, but lest we run out of breath before we finish singing here. And so, uh, Lingal, of course, is one of the major languages out of the 200 that are spoken in the Congo. Easily cross a, a, a river and, and go into another language. But Lingal is very widespread. It's used by the soldiers. And um, in Lingala, John 3.16 will go like this. In Pamate, I've been tongue-tied all day. I'm seko. So you all understood that. Uh, but in Lungkutu, it sounds like this. Wandentambiasolangakabokilinkongone, <clears throat> Hmm. How about uh, Kituba? Now, where should we go from there? Sure. After Suriname? Yeah. All right. If you were to take a ship and sail now back westward towards the USA, go on down south, sail past the Caribbean islands, sail past Venezuela, sail past British Guyana, now just called Guyana, you'd come to the land of Suriname. Now Suriname is bordered on the south by Brazil, on the west by uh, Guyana, formerly British Guyana, and on the east by French Guyana. You'd sail up the Suriname River to Paramaribo, the capital, and there you might go into one of our churches, and they were speaking English. For we have a church there, pastored by a convert out of Islam. His wife was a Hindu. We discipled and trained him. And last year, his church went totally independent in the capital city, packed out with people saved out of Islam and Hinduism and Catholicism, has a seven-day-a-week radio broadcast every morning for about 20 minutes early, an hour and a half on Saturday, two and a half hours on Sunday, is now on another radio station as well, and a television program every other week in which he gives the gospel to the people of, of uh, Suriname just before their football wet straight, their soccer game. And uh, at the present time, their Bible college is going up. They have a two-story building, beautiful, beautiful church built by the people themselves. They've opened a Bible college to train Guyanese to go back to Guyana and plant churches. And this the fruit of the ministry there in Suriname. So there you find English being spoken. You might go into one of our churches and hear him singing in Dutch. You might go into another church and hear him sing, uh, speaking in, in Swanantongo. Another in Juka or Akan. And uh, let give you an idea of this language. The word work, for instance. Work in English, work in Dutch. Now, the African peoples in, the, in 
Virtually all of the African languages, they have no R sound. Only a few African languages have an R sound. So they couldn't say work when they were slaves to the British. They couldn't say work when they were slaves to the Dutch. And so they changed it. They Africanized it. They put a vowel on the end. Lingala has a vowel on every word. It makes very musical. If you know how to preach in Lingala, you can preach in poetry for half an hour. And so they put a vowel on it, and they called work Woloko. Others of them said Woloko. When they got enough education, some of them, to use an R, they called it Roko. And so you might go into one of our churches and hear Roko. You might go into another one and hear Woloko. And another one here, Walko, depend on where you are in the country. Same language, but the differences in the way they pronounce it. And in this strange language, a mixture of African languages, plus spoiled Dutch, French, English, Portuguese, and Hebrew, picked up from their various slave masters. This language, you'd hear the little chorus, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, go like this. John 3.16 in that strange language goes like this. Well, of course, Suriname for many years until 1975 was a Dutch colony. And so Dutch is taught in all of the schools and, and their brand of Dutch. John 3.16 would sound like this. Want also leave here hard hard. Dat is een enige woord van gegeven heeft. Dat dan ieder in heel geloof niet voor lang gaan, maar ik wil het lief hebben. So that sounds something like, something like Pennsylvania does, a few words here and there. Well, Louise, go ahead with the ladies. We sort of feel lonely up here. Everyone else that's come up has had their family. But the Lord has blessed us with our three sons serving with us in Suriname and the grandchildren are there, so there wasn't any way we could have family with us today. But thank you so much for being the larger family for us. We have so enjoyed being with you, and it's just so nice to talk with you and enjoy this fellowship. I was wondering how the ladies, the sisters here, were sort of feeling after seeing the slides and the ones that have spoken about missionary service. There's a real place for us on the mission field. Yes, the men are training the national preachers and doing the church ministry, but there are women out there, and there are children that need us. And I thank the Lord for the opportunity I've had to minister to women in the Congo, to teach them and to help them know what Christian women of the Bible are like. And down there in Suriname, out in the jungles, where it's a matriarchal society and therefore all the more important for those women to understand the teaching of the Word of God and that it isn't just building your family that's the important thing, getting their girls to reproduce whether they're married or not. The important thing is knowing the Word of God. The ministry I had with them in the beginning when we first went, going over to the village and sitting on some little piece of wood or something like that, I wasn't quite sure how to start at first, and you pray about things you don't know. The Lord said, well, sew with them. That's something very simple, and that's something we do a lot of, isn't it? And I just did a little embroidery project with them, took a long while because I wasn't in a big rush to get the project done. I was interested in time with them, living before them as I told them what the Word of God said. When we finished our little motto that just simply said, Believe Jesus, 
It was ready to hang in their house as a little motto on the wall. Eighteen women had come to trust the Lord as their Savior. Very simple thing, but a means of reaching out to them and seeing what God would do in their lives. One of our most recent blessings down in Suriname this last November and December was to see children of these women coming and saying they want to trust the Lord as their Savior. If you stay in what God gives you to do, you can see the fruit going on to other generations. So it was a real joy to baptize 15 of these, what we can call our spiritual grandchildren. And that got others interested who were considering, who were thinking about it. But when they saw these others making that decision and, and taking that step and not being afraid, then others were following. And so the work is going on down there with the women and with the children. And I thank the Lord. My life has been invested in helping where there was just darkness and fear and superstition. So you pray for us because when we finish our schedule of meetings here in the States, we expect to go right back down to Suriname. Some of you uh, have listened, many of you have listened to the tape, Love with Shoes On. This little pamphlet, I've put a number downstairs on that table. If you're interested in it, you're welcome to it. It's the story about my mother and father who served the Lord out there. My mother, the Lord, took her home when she was only 48. But my father lived to 85, 60 years in the Lord's service on the mission field. So that's down there. And if you're interested in a prayer card, we appreciate your prayer so much. We'd be happy if you'd take that. And thank you very much. Thank you. Louise is um, very much involved in teaching the student wives in the Bible colleges. She'll have them twice a, a week for um, four hours at night. And she trained. You see, we the, one of the mistakes we make in missions is to train the men and fail to train the women. A student will go into Bible college and he'll be there four years, maybe six if he takes a master's. His wife is sitting in an apartment taking care of the children. And the four years they're there, she, she has two more. They've left the business, especially the, the married students when they come in. They've sold their houses, they've sold one of their cars. And now a little tiny apartment, about a third the size of the house they used to have. His wife is struggling to take care of the children. And every day he's in school. He learns things and grows. And step by step he leaves his wife behind. And as that happens, when he is graduated and they're headed for the mission field of the pastor, then we tell the wife, now be a pastor's wife or a missionary's wife. Impossible. Can't do the job. And so we've let the schools that know that and told them how serious it is and asked them, give the, the student wives to my wife and let her train them. And that's what she's doing. Well, I'm training the men, she's training the women. And I trust that that's the same here, that the women get the training, Bible training, teaching training, so that uh, they can go out. Because I look, at, I look at the missionary couple as both missionaries. Now, the man's the leader. He is in authority. His wife works with him and under him. But she ought to have the sure knowledge that the God of heaven has called her to the mission field. Because when she gets into hard places, when the children are sick and dying, when fever is raging in her body, when there's danger, then her understanding of the will of God for her is going to be tested. And another one of the great problems on the mission field is men leaving the field because their wives can't take it. They need to know that the God of heaven has called them as well as their husband to that field. Now let me just talk for a minute about African time here. Give you an idea of the, the concept of the Africans. I mentioned that no African language before missionaries had arrived had a word for eternal or everlasting. 
you'll find that basically African languages don't have a true future tense. Because in their thinking, in their thinking, the future extends out here about two months. The exceptional African in the African setting might be able to think on occasion two years ahead, but that's exceptional. There, and this is from reading and study, that I understand this, they have, and it's typical, in the Kikuyu language, they call the past Zamani. The past is infinite. It goes back as far as you can look. That's Zamani. They call the present Sasa, S-A-S-A. That's the present. And if you stretch the present a little bit, you get there two months out from today. Now, if you understand that, you understand why basically their ministries are disorganized. Why basically there's no planning. If, if there is no future, you don't plan for it. You see. So, here it is, two months out there. That's as far as their thinking goes. That's the future. But the future is right in. It's just a stretched out present because of the fact that it's their feeling across Africa that if you can't hold on to it, if you can't see it with your eyes and hold it with your hands, it's not real. So anything that cannot be imagined, almost felt, disappears from consciousness. Now what happens when someone dies? Now their concept of time really comes into play. We ask, why do the Africans go to an altar, pour out a libation, or put an oblation, uh, something solid on there, some meat or bread or whatever, on, on that altar and pray to the spirits of the dead. The reason being, beloved, that they believe when someone dies, the spirit does not depart. Now, we understand from Scripture that when someone dies, the spirit of a lost person goes to hell, waiting for judgment. The spirit of a saved person goes into the presence of God. But you have to understand, because of the fact that they have locked themselves into these philosophies, Africa has never produced a prophet or a philosopher. The reason being, if they have no future, there's no reason for a prophet or a philosopher. So when an African dies, they believe that the spirit is still right around here. Kind of certain them, they call them yoka. And that spirit can be communicated with. But the person who is to communicate with that spirit must know that person from personal acquaintance so they can talk with them by name. Now, when they need help, when they have troubles, when they have a lack, when there's sickness or death, to whom do they go? They go to the spirits of the dead. They call them literally the living dead. Dead from the body, but alive yet in the spirit. And so they make that offering and they call upon that spirit by name and they talk with that spirit and they ask for help. Now, that spirit will stay there as long as there is someone on earth that knew them personally and can come and talk to them by name. Now you begin to understand why Africans want two and three wives and huge families. Because if you have a huge family, including the extended families of your brothers and sisters, then you have many people who will eventually come and talk to you as one of the living dead and keep you from death. Because when the last person comes who knew that dead person by name and could talk to them face to face by name, when that last person dies on earth, then this spirit, this living dead that has been surviving sometimes for five generations, if you have enough children, and enough extended family, a living, a living dead, a dead lit spirit could stay within communication with those in the body for five generations. But when that last person dies, this dead 
this living dead spirit with no one to communicate with goes back into oblivion. Not into the future. Into the past. Now, if you have ideas like that about time, then you begin to understand why to the African there's no such thing as wasting time. Because to us, time is a commodity. Time is a commodity to be bought and sold and used. You businessmen are all about that. To the African, time is made when needed. So African men sitting and talking about nothing and laughing and joking while their wives cut the firewood, while their wives cook the food, while their wives take care of the babies, while the wives carry in the cassava with loads of firewood on their back, 130, 40 pounds, with a baby on one hip and another little child on the other hand and her husband walking alongside holding his bow and arrow. Mm. And those men sit and talk and story and what have you. We would say they're wasting time. That offends them. They're not wasting time. Time doesn't exist until you create it to use it. And now you're a missionary and you want to make plans. You're going to plan the whole year ahead. And you're going to schedule everything. Good luck. <laughs> a pastor from here would only understand it when he visits. America is the land of predictability. The year 2000, my, year, my schedule for year 2000 has two days still open. For 2001, it's filling up. For 2002, it's starting to come. Request meetings. I have already bought tickets for some of those places. Why? Because America is predictable. I have it all scheduled. It's in my Casio boss system. All of those dates are highlighted. Right? It's in your day timer. See? That's America. We're the land of predictability. You can schedule two years ahead and be virtually certain that what you schedule two years ahead will take the place on the day that you scheduled it. That's the USA. And you get out into the foreign fields, especially in the third world, where they have this mentality concerning time, and you're fortunate to schedule two months ahead. And then you can expect 50% of what you scheduled not to go the way you scheduled it. And that's part of learning to be a missionary in Africa. Well, there's so much we can say about time, and let's go on to something else. What was, again, your question now? Okay. Let me, let me give you some things on that. Let's talk first, if you'll open your Bibles to the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Let's first look at verse 19. The missionary going out to the field needs to understand the matter of being enculturated. And in this matter of being enculturated, then you have to understand whether you have a matriarchal society or a patriarchal society. Louise mentioned that in Suriname, our Bush Negroes are matriarchal. What does that mean? That means the wife is the, is the boss of the home. That's simply. She's boss. Her husband is a convenience. A convenience because she is building her family by producing children. And her daughters will produce children and build her family. And that means that if you go to the mission field and you don't understand whether those people are matriarchal or patriarchal, you're in trouble. Because your mindset is undoubtedly... You go to the mission field and you win and disciple men. And those men with saved wives and children develop that family to godliness as the head of the home. That's biblical. 
and that's American, that, that exists only in 13% of the populations of the world. The other 87% have a totally different concept. A matriarchal society goes back to what cultural anthropologists call the ego. The ego is the original progenitor of that family. If the ego is female, then every person in that extended family over centuries of time in reality relates back into the lineage of that woman. That's why our people question my wife. Why in the world when we read the Bible don't we find the names of the women? And Louise said, I'm glad you asked me that question. Because biblically the man is the head of the home. Do you know how many years they've struggled with that? If you as men found a Bible that told you that the woman is the head of the home, you'd have some struggles giving up your authority. No? Right. Do you think those in a matriarchal society do not have struggles with giving it up? They have ruled for thousands of years. Their whole society is built. The Bush Negro peoples are said to have come from three sisters. Not three brothers, three sisters. And they consider those to be the progenitors of the five tribes of Bush Negroes in Suriname. So what are you going to do in a place where the women in the beginning are the heads of the home. You're going to major not only in winning men and discipling them, but in winning women and discipling them. In fact, you may well put more effort into winning the women and more effort into discipling them in the beginning than you will the men. Because you know that if this, this pastor does not marry a godly woman who is submitted to the biblical principle of male leadership, there will come a time even in that pastor's life when, he, when she is going to draw a line in the sand and he will not cross it. Because to cross it would destroy his family and put him out of the ministry. So when you're working to understand the people, one of the things you need to understand is are they matriarchal? or patriarchal. And in Congo, our people were patriarchal. That is, they descended from a male. Now, here's another thing you have to understand. That isn't just paper stuff. That's life. When I said that only 13% of the world's population have a biblical setup for the family, I was speaking truth. Only those who have been impacted by Christianity and Judaism and Islam. Now, what do the others do? They have extended families, descended from a matriarch or a patriarch. That means that the decision-making of the family is not left up to this young man and the bride he has just taken. They have no right to do that. They live and do what their extended family tells them to do. That's why in, in India those two girls have died. Who killed them? Their family. Who gave them up? Their family. They had no right under the extended family system of making that individual choice. And when they made an individual choice and determined to stick by it, the family exercised their historic right to remove that wound from the family, that sickness from the family. And you begin to understand that and you really realize the reason these things happen. Hmm? So you find that in such a society, when the leadership is against you, you don't just say, well, I have my rights. 
You have no rights. In America, we, we love our rights. Sometimes I'm frightened by it. I'm an American. I have my rights. You discover you cross the seas and get into some of these places and you have no rights. And that's the condition that these people are in and all of these extended families. There's many things we can say about it. But we need to go out ready for this type of thing, understanding. Verse 19 of 1 Corinthians chapter 9, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now here's a bond slave missionary applying his bond slavery. He says, I have made myself a servant. That's doulos. It's the common word for bond slave. I have made myself a bond slave to all that I might gain the more. Now, just very briefly, look at what he did. How he adapted to a people. Unto the Jews, verse 20, I became as a Jew. The first thing he did was identify ethnically. Mm -hmm. Unto them that are under the law as under the law. He did the same thing with the Gentiles. Now, what does it mean there to be under the law as under the law? He's speaking there, of course, of the Jews. Here is their cultural way. They were under the law. Ethnically, they were Jews. Culturally, they lived as Jews. You'll find when the Apostle Paul preached to the Jews, he preached from the Old Testament. He took his illustrations from the Old Testament. He took his quotes from the Old Testament prophets. Why? Because that was their culture. They were ethnically Jews. They were culturally Jews fed on the Old Testament. And so he preached from the Old Testament to them. But he says now, verse 21, to them that are without the law as without the law. He discovered that he couldn't live with the Gentiles like he lived with the Jews. I came in here. I took off my tie. I, the first day I felt naked without that thing. I wondered how in the world. But I, this time I wore a shirt that's really well pressed. I've always hidden that with my tie. I'm just kidding. But the Apostle Paul, much more seriously, he fit in with them. He spoke their language. He lived in their houses. He traveled as they did. He knew their history. You go to, to Acts chapter, what is it, 17, where he's on Marv's Hill. He knew their history. He had read the three Greek history books that dealt with the altar to the unknown God. He knew of Epimenides and his coming to Athens and calling upon Jehovah God and seeing a miraculous deliverance from the plague that had been massacring. He had their history in hand. How many of us as missionaries go with the history of the country to which we're going in hand? Almost no one. I'm an American. I'll be like a bull in the chital shop. I'll show them how I can plow a groove in that place. Yeah. Give you a good example of one who did better than that. Jeff Adams is the, pre the pastor of Kansas City Baptist Temple, a church that has now started 32 churches in the USA and many on the mission field. We have become involved with them in preaching conferences for them and especially in teaching their missionaries. They have in, in that church what they call Shepherd School. They meet 30 Saturdays every year from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Last year they asked me, to come and teach and our son David to come and teach. I taught on the cosmic warfare for about two and a half or three hours. There were 120 laymen there. Those laymen will be in that program for five years. They will have had to finish discipleship level one and as, as disciplers discipled the next group. So they're now in discipleship level two, discipling those coming in on discipleship level one. They've had a biblical gospel preached to them. 
and they're on fire for missions. I don't know how many million dollars they gave last year to missions. I wonder. Incredible. When I preached one closing conference there at the invitation, there were 32 families at the altar committed to going to the mission field. Every week, that congregation has 64 ministries all over Kansas City, all laymen doing it, prisons, everywhere else. He says, if you don't reach the, the entire community, you're not doing the job as a church. And so they have a Spanish department. And Sunday school is in Spanish with a Spanish pastor and teachers. They have a Russian department. And that department is in Russian with Russian teachers. They have a black department. And that department is in black with black teachers. And then they come together in the service. And out of there go family after family groups. Two families stood up at one conference that we were in. I was in March last year. And they, there were 18 including children, a couple of big families. They had quit their jobs and sold their homes. And they're going as two families to Billings, Montana to start a church. They're following in the footsteps of their pastor because he spent many years in... El Salvador and Nicaragua as missionary. Went through all of the wars down there. In fact, in the one in El Salvador, 200 of his neighbors were shot to death by death squads. His wife and, and he had three daughters, I believe, and they looked at their house and the angle of the bullets might come, and they decided that hiding under the sink in the kitchen was the safest place. His people asked him, Aren't you going to leave us? Aren't you going to go back to America where it's safe? And he said to them, If I were to leave you, I would give the lie to everything I ever taught you about God. And he saw a string of churches built on solid expository preaching and discipleship. And you know how he went out? When he left the shores of the United States, he left his English Bible at home. And from that moment, he studied and preached from his Spanish Bible. He studied Spanish history. He studied Spanish literature. He studied Spanish poetry. He can speak in Spanish so fluent they can't tell him from a national. He quotes their history to them. He quotes their literature. He quotes their poetry to them. He has enculturated. You see? In Italy, Bill Standridge, our first missionary, been there 50 years. I asked his son, David, if uh, an Italian listening to his father could guess that he wasn't an Italian. He said, well, if, if an Italian listened all day to my father, he might hear an inflection here or there that would make him question from what part of Italy he came. He speaks English with an Italian accent. That, beloved, is enculturation. That's our goal. Don't leave the shores of the United States without having studied thoroughly the history of the country to which you're going. Without st having studied everything you can find on their culture. And go out there with a determination that you will bond with those people by thoroughly studying their language. And then you go beyond that because you have to understand that when you go to the mission field, all you have for a screen upon which to, to play your thoughts, even your way of studying your Bible and understanding your Bible and decision making, the only screen you have upon which to play your thoughts and make decisions is the American screen, the American mental screen. And I have to tell you that American mental screen is totally inadequate to serve you in another culture. Before you can be an effective missionary, you must have developed the mental screen of that country. And in order to do that, you're going to have to study their language and study the people until that culture becomes a part of your thinking and your very blood. And you ought to be able to sit in the midst of a group of those people. Now they're talking in Proverbs. Now they're talking in riddles. Now they're talking in slang. 
Now they're talking about historic incidences and what have you. And if you're really the missionary you ought to be, you ought to be able to sit there and understand all of it. That's what's called bonding. See? The big mistake missionaries often make is once they get enough language to start preaching, they start preaching and stop learning. Disastrous mistake. The best thing a missionary can do when he first gets on the field is shut his mouth and open his ears. Be a great help to him. Sure, seek to win the loss, talk with folks, work on your vocabulary and what have you, and be ready for culture shock. Because it's not going to happen because of the food and the climate and the, that thing. That's, that's tourist stuff. But you'll have gone out there looking at those people through rose-tinted glasses. When you first arrive, you'll think those people are the most wonderful, most lovable people on the face of the globe. They're not. You know where the idea of rose-tinted glasses came from? We found out one time when a church gave us $400 and said, take a vacation. They asked us when we'd had a vacation. We told them, we counted back, it was 10 years. We don't know what vacations are. We travel a lot, but it's always in ministry. A time out for ourselves, five days a week for ourselves to do nothing, we couldn't live that way. My wife would go bananas. But they gave us $400 on the proviso that we use it to take a vacation on our honor. And so, because I'd been to Catalina Island several times with my mother, beautiful place, and you'd always see the whales going across the, the uh, inlet there between San, San Long Beach, California and Catalina Island. And you go in a glass bottom boat and you can see all of these beautiful things. And then there's a Wrigley Plantation, the Wrigley Chewing Brother chewing gum family and all of their riches, that big plantation there, beautiful. Besides, they had the idea if I went there and I'd find a church that would support us, then I'd have a reason to have to go back every five years. <laughs> anyway, we got across. And um, had a nice time, came back, and we stayed on board the Queen Elizabeth. It's a hotel, it's floating, but the screw's been removed. There's five, I think, five restaurants and cafeterias in there. There's a wedding chapel. And there's the beautiful state rooms and everything. And in looking over and wandering over this huge ship, we went into one of the tourist class cabins that's not being used as a bedroom. And there the glass was tinted pink. And there was a little sign beside it explaining why. You see, that ship did not have the stabilizers that the more modern ship has. And when they got into rough seas, that ship pitched and rolled in spite of its size. And half of the, half of the passenger uh, list was on, at the rail, emptying, losing everything they'd had for breakfast and lunch and supper. And when they went back, ghastly green to their tourist cabin, and they walked in. They could not see the green because the glass was all paint, tinted pink. And seeing that, that made them feel quite a bit better. They really didn't look as green as they felt. You see? And that's the condition of missionaries. You go out there, you're with tourist eyes. You have to understand, too, when you go out there visiting just to visit, and you don't stay a couple of years, you're still seeing a lot of things with tourist eyes. But after about a year of language study, and you think you're getting it, and you have a little conversation with one of the nationals, and he keeps saying, mm-hmm, 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 he said, boy, your heart is really singing. And then somebody walks by and he asks him, what's he saying? And then you realize, beloved, that you're in a position where you wonder if you're able, ever going to be able from heart and spirit to really communicate with these people and get the job done. And when that heavy cloud descends on you and you start getting discouraged about it, you're suffering culture shock. 
you survive that and go back for your second term, then you're in pretty good shape. So the Apostle Paul went in and inculturated as a Jew that he might gain the Jews to them that were culturally under the law that he might gain them that are under the law as a Gentile to them who were without the law. So in ethnically and culturally he adapted to them and even philosophically look in verse 22 to the weak became I as weak. Okay, this person doesn't have all the brain power you have. Okay, this person is dirty. Okay, this person, by you should wish he'd break loose. Why doesn't he take that next step? Then you accept him in his weakness. And you wait for him. And you pray for him. And you work with him. And eventually, somewhere down the line, you begin to understand he doesn't take that next step because if, his, if he does, his wife's going to walk off with the children. And her mother will keep her until he crawls on his knees to get her back. Or he does this and his whole family is going to ostracize him and put him out. And finally the day comes when he has the courage and, and the missionary's wife's been working with his wife and she's bowed the knee to the word of God and begun to obey and said, My husband his head and where he goes I'll go with him and then you see the man take the step and while he's weak then you adapt yourself philosophically to him so the apostle Paul gave us the example now we have about 20 minutes let me give you just 5 minutes on a special subject of mine and then I'll give you 15 to close this I have notes for him, but I'll just pull it out of my head at the moment. You have to understand also that the idea you might have in America that all of the sheep can be turned into shepherds is not biblical. People had that idea in America for a long time. If you only teach people and disciple them and work with them hard enough, you'll have a whole bunch of shepherds. Not true. You see, if you study Scripture, I was studying 1 Corinthians. If you look chapter 1, chapter 1, if you read the first nine verses, it, it, it sounds like this church was descended out of heaven in a, in a sheet under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you, and grace from God the Father, our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, in that, that in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord." If the, by, the book of 1 Corinthians stopped there, beloved, you'd have thought this was the most wonderful church that ever existed on the face of the globe. But I read on through the book and I wondered, how in the world could the Apostle Paul write the first nine verses? I couldn't have. They're wild in tongues there. Women are out of place there. There's adultery amongst them. The Corinthians, you realize, were in one of the most sodomized and bestial Areas of the world to Corinthianize meant to fornicate. It, they were a legend. They were a proverb. Their temples were filled with, with temple prostitutes. And they hadn't gotten entirely over it. There were a bunch of people in that church that had been in slavery and had been married again and again by the slave masters to others. Marry this muscular young man to this beautiful young woman, woman, and get children out of her. And then when she starts looking not so beautiful anymore, marry him to another one and another one, and marry that one to another one. They had bred them like cattle, and now they're Christians and they want to know if they dare get married again. Paul's up to here. 
up to here in huge problems. And I wondered how in the world did Paul handle that? How, how come it didn't break him? If I were to write back to my supporting churches about things like this in the churches I've started, I'd lose my support overnight. And then, So he writes a whole book on in Christ. How in the world did he handle this? This man had come to understand the principle of capacity. Let me show it to you very quickly in the book of Matthew. You won't find this in any books. This comes by the Spirit of God through experience and study. Matthew chapter 13. We're hurrying because I have one more thing to give you. The Lord Jesus gives the first the parable of the sowing of the seed. He then defines it in, in verse 18 down through verse 23. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed in the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed amongst the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. What is characterized, characteristic of all of these, these three different kinds of seed is that they never bore fruit. Biblical conclusion, they were never saved. It is impossible to be truly born again without bearing fruit. Impossibility. You cannot be burst into the family of God, first convicted of sin and righteousness and judgment that brings you before the God of heaven, mute, with no excuse under condemnation. And then be turned to the Lord Jesus Christ, enlightened to see Him as the sovereign God of the universe, indeed hanging on Calvary's cross for your sin and placing your faith in Him as your God and your Savior. And then the Holy Spirit birthing you into the family of God. Baptizing you into the body of Christ. Becoming the earnest and seal of God upon you. Becoming your teacher, your guide leading into all truth. Teaching you to groan for the things of eternity. That presence of the Holy Spirit must make a change. You cannot claim to be saved and have so few symptoms of salvation as you might have with a common cold, an impossibility. Amen. But, and that word but is very important in Scripture, when you hear but, you're going to see the other side of the issue. Verse, 12, verse 23, But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now what do we understand here? We understand the good, the good ground is where the seed of the Word of God produces faith and salvation. But we understand that those who come to believe do not all have the same capacity. Now, Look at one other place. And I have lots of notes on these. And lots more to say, but we're hurrying for the sake of getting something said on it. We're in Matthew chapter 23, pardon me, chapter 25, and we're reading verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Unto the one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Listen to this phrase now. This is key. To every man according to his several ability. What had this landowner, this businessman discovered? He had discerned. He had three stewards. And he had discerned that one of these stewards could handle five talents. That the other 
could handle two, and the third could handle one. He gave to every man according to his several ability. Now we know the story. The one who had five talents went out and earned five more. What was the accolade? What was the reward of that, ta that one with five talents? Verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now the man with two talents went out. He had fewer than half of the man with five. However, he went out and gained two talents. He comes back, listen to his reward. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Is there a difference between those two men's reward? None. Because there's a principle involved here. What happened to the fellow with one? He buried it. He comes back and says, I was afraid, verse 25, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, gathered where I strawed not. And of course he was had the talent taken from him and got no reward. What was the difference? The difference, beloved, was not in their production. The difference was in their faithfulness to live up to their capacity. The man with five talents gained five. The man with two gained two and they got identical rewards. The question was not how much he did, but how faithfully he, was do, he did in living up to his capacity. He had fulfilled the desire of his master who had discerned his several ability. The man who got in trouble did not get in trouble because he had one talent. He got in trouble because he did not use it to his capacity. Now there's the principle of capacity. Now what you have to understand, and I've tested this again and again, I've had many a preacher come to me weeping when he discovered it. First time I ever preached it, I discovered it and been studying it. And I'd also found scientific evidence for it out of the medical world. And I went to a church on a, what gal was it, Wednesday evening? prayer meeting. It's a church in Greensboro, North Carolina. There are three there that I can't go into without having to preach. Not unannounced. Doesn't make any difference. If I walk in and I'm seen by the preacher, I preach. And I've never heard that preacher preach. And I wanted to hear him preach. And so I said, well, I'll get him this time. The reason I went in, we went in late. We went in when they were standing up to sing what we thought was the last song. We sat down beside, behind something big, someone big and tall. Unfortunately, it wasn't the last song. They were going to take the offering. And when the preacher came down to pray so they'd take the offering, he spied me. Oh, Brother Champlin, I didn't see you come in. Come up and preach. I said, Brother, I don't have a scrap of paper in my Bible, not a single outline. He said, That's no problem. The Bible's full of them. So while they sang the last song in taking the offering, I scribbled on the back of the prayer seat in the front, the pew up ahead of me, the principle of capacity. I got up and preached it for the first time. He came to me afterward, tears streaming down his face. Oh, if I had known that, I would not have been in agony for the past three years. What had happened? Every congregation, and this one I would look here and I'd say there's virtually none because of your background. You've come out of something, and that takes courage. It takes strength. It takes determination. But in every congregation, there's a certain percentage of threes. I call them listeners. They love God. Occasionally, they win a soul to Christ. They pray. They give some. But you preach to them your whole life, and they don't change. They don't move beyond that. They get to a certain place, and they plateau off. And when they plateau off, the preacher looks and he notices it. And he says, oh my, if I only talk better, if I only preach better, I, 
God would reach them, and so he redoubles his effort in, in study and in preaching, and still nothing happens. And then he decides they're not growing because they're stubborn, because they're carnal, they're resisting. And once he believes that, he stops flagating himself for it being his fault, and there comes a sharp little edge into his preaching. And when that happens, the people say, Mmm, boy, something's bothering the preacher. And when that goes on, give that a year or so, either the preacher leaves or they leave. And that's what was happening to him. So you have to understand, beloved, that in every society, where you go, every culture, there'll be a certain classification of, preacher, of people who plateau off and don't go any further. Mm -hmm. But you'll find also that in every culture there are some sixties. I call those laborers. And in every culture, and virtually all of them, the smallest percentage is leadership. They're the hundreds. Now, how do you know the difference? That's where Bible study comes in. The, one of the very first things you ought to do as a missionary, when you have a group of people saved and you begin to disciple them, teach them how to study God's Word for themselves. Now, there are books for that. I have six different methods that I pass on to my students. I teach them two of those methods in theology of missions to prepare them. I've given the notes to many preachers and many missionaries. Teach them how to study God's Word for themselves. You'll teach them subjects, yes. But that happens in many Bible colleges. They teach subjects. Now who gets the best grades? The smart guys. They've got a good intellect, so they get high grades. And we falsely assume that because they get high grades and all of these things, they're leadership for God's work, and that's not necessarily true. How do you test the God-given ability of a man to lead? By teaching him first how to study the Bible for himself. And as he studies God's Word for himself, he begins to know things that you haven't taught him yet. You see a greater love for the person of God than his peers. You see a greater willingness to separate from the sin of his culture than his peers. You see a greater uh, desire and willingness to suffer than his peers. And when you see that, you have located your leadership. Now those are the men into whom you ought to pour yourselves to develop them because they are the axle upon which your ministry is going to turn. And unless you know the principle of capacity, and unless you know how to train men to study God's Word for themselves, you're in trouble. A missionary in China, pardon me, in the Philippines, was ready to leave his field. He'd done his work. He was moving elsewhere. Thirty years he'd worked there, and he had an outstanding young man. Oh, this man was brilliant. He said to this young man, I am going to take three months and review with you everything that I've ever taught you. And he did that. And at the close of that three months, he asked the young man, now we've reviewed everything. Is there anything that I haven't taught you that you'd like to know? And the young man said, well, I was a good student, wasn't I? I've learned to preach. I've learned to teach. I've learned to administer. I've learned finances. I've learned organization. And I can do all of those things well. But there is one thing that you have not taught me, that I would like to know. Sir, I would like to know the secret of your wealth. Now, how do you felt, think that missionary felt? He'd made a big mistake. He made a mistake Bible colleges and Christian universities make all the time. Judge the ability of a man to lead by how smart he is. Great to have great intellect and a great spiritual capacity together. You don't always find it that way. And you must seek to find your people's spiritual 
capacity. And you do that by teaching them how to study God's Word for themselves. The threes will fade away. All excited in the beginning, but they don't follow through. The sixes will plateau off. And the tens, the leadership, they'll go like a house of fire. And when you see the symptoms, you have discovered your leadership. We got three minutes. I can't give you what I'd wanted to give. I'd like to have taken you with through a couple of chapters of the book of Romans concerning a biblical gospel. But let me close with just an illustration of it. We were in the jungles of Congo. Daniel Grings, my wife's nephew, and I, myself were traveling. We had come down that river that you saw in the slides, the two of us, with two dirt bikes. Fuel, you can't find fuel. Medicines and literature. We had to put two outboard engines on the transom because one would not flame the boat. We got down. We traveled through the villages and on one, one trail we found two new churches being built. We stopped to talk with those folks and Dad said, look, why don't you go on ahead and set up camp and I'll come along. It was already dark. And I was tooling down this trail on my dirt bike. And here was a little village off to the side. Of course, there's no light in those villages. There's no electricity. They're so poor they can't afford kerosene, so there are no lanterns. When they really need light, they build a fire or maybe uh, uh, put a, a, a stick with pitch, pitch uh, pasted to it uh, as a torch. Put that up somewhere. And so I pulled in and stopped by the this old campfire and started talking with the people. And a little man came up to me, an old man. He said, Missionary, I was a witch doctor until last week. And last week, one of your preachers led me to Christ. Would you, my wife wants to be saved too. Would you please talk to her? I said, it's so late. Please, we're only half a mile from the, where I'm going to sleep. Please have her come early in the morning. She did crack a dawn. Here's a woman pushing 80, totally illiterate, probably never been 50 miles from her birthplace. I started with God. I taught her first about God the Creator. I taught her about His love. I taught her about His holiness. I taught her about His hatred of sin. I taught her about His judgment of sin. I taught her about the fall of Adam and Eve and how in Adam and Eve we all fell and are all sinners in our heart. Then I taught her about the judgment of sin. And at last I taught her about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and whose crucifixion, his burial and his resurrection. I taught her about believing and receiving the Lord Jesus as her Creator, Sovereign God, and her Savior who hung on Calvary's cross. I taught her about being written in the book of life of God. And after about an hour, I said to her, Now, would you like to talk to that God? And she said, Yes, I would. And she lifted her hand, eyes to heaven, and she said, Oh, God, oh, powerful God of the universe, the creator of everything, the creator of me. And, oh God, you're so holy and you hate sin, and I'm such a terrible sinner. And then she began, began for the next ten minutes to catalog her sin, her fornication, her adultery, her witchcraft, her lewdness, her lies, her stealing, everything, her service to the idols of Satan. She listed them one after another. And then she looked up to God again and said, God, you're just. And if you wish, you could throw me into the lake of fire and you would be right, for I am guilty and I am worthy of death. But I'm told that you love me enough to hang on a cross and shed your blood to pay for my sins. And I come to you to ask me, please forgive my sin. Please write my name in your book of life. That's an illiterate woman. But that's an illiterate woman who was given a biblical gospel. 
I think she's in glory. I know she's in glory. You take the book of Romans. I can leave notes for it if you like. We're out of time. Paul the Apostle says in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and then he talks about the gospel. To whom has been committed the gospel? And then he says, this gospel is found in the prophets. So what is the gospel? It's the godhood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the holy life of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his priesthood. And it's his coming dominion. That's him, because, beloved, the gospel is not a plan to be believed. It's a person, a glorious, sovereign God of the universe who hung on Calvary's cross, a person to be received. And then he gives in chapter 4 his glorious Holy Spirit example of saving faith. After he has proved in the first three chapters that the whole world is guilty before God and is mute before God with no excuse. Then he tells the Jews that this righteous God can be righteous and forgive the one who believes in Jesus. Why? Because of the justification, because of the redemption, because of the propitiation, because of the remission of sins, purchased by the blood of His incarnate Son on Calvary's cross. And then he says in chapter 4, let me illustrate it. And he tells about Abraham. He says, now Abraham is the father of the faithful. And then he explains that Abraham believed God, who against hope, believed in hope. What had happened? Twenty-five years before he'd been promised a child. Nothing happened. He was persuaded by his wife to take Hagar and they got Ishmael. Now he's in trouble. Now he's 100 and his wife is in her 90s and God comes on his way to Sodom and Gomorrah with two messages, one of joy and one of justice and judgment. And the one of joy was, Sarah, you and Abraham are going to have the son. And Sarah laughed. God said, you laughed. She said, I didn't. Yes, you did. But she laughed with good reason. She knew her body. And she knew there was no human way she could have a child. <laughs> she smiled. <laughs> that man. <laughs> Him, Father. <laughs> she was right on target. But Abraham, knowing the situation, which was absolutely impossible, against hope, believed in hope. That, beloved, is the Holy Spirit's own illustration of saving faith. A sinner so lost that they stand guilty before the God of heaven, hopelessly lost, and their mouth is shut. I'm doomed, I'm doomed, there's no hope. And then the glorious news that God, this God who could justly cast them into hell, can justly forgive their sins because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus on Calvary's cross, purchasing justification and redemption and propitiation and remission of their sins and against the impossibility of ever being, believe, being saved, they believe. Anything less than that, beloved, is not the gospel. Use the biblical gospel on the mission field. Not a hurried five-minute dash down the Romans road, but a biblical gospel. That gospel, the Romans road, has destroyed the churches of America. Filled them with tears. Destroyed pro 
expository preaching demanded topical preaching because a church half filled with tares cannot abide expository preaching. Preach a biblical gospel. Soul win with the biblical gospel. Don't be pushed into pushing people into receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior until they thoroughly understand, no matter how old or young they may be. Wait for evidence of deep remorse and lostness. Do it the Bible way. Father, bless this portion of thy word to our hearts and the things we've discussed. Teach me, O God, teach us, and use us, O God, around this world to the salvation of multitudes. For Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you. Thanks. Very good advice. Very good advice. If you've never been in a mission field and don't understand culture and culture shock and how that thing is very different, just, just mark his words. He was right on from what I know. I don't know very much. Thank you, brother, for sharing with us how we have enjoyed you coming, you and your dear wife, sharing with us these couple days. God bless you richly. And uh, we want to thank you very much for that.